This is January 6, 2011. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott. We are privileged to have with us today Michael Anthony. Welcome, Michael. Thanks for having me. May I ask when you were born? Uh, April 5th, 1986. And where were you born? Uh, South Shore, Massachusetts. Where is your current address? Uh, Bridgewater, Massachusetts. Marital status? Uh, single. Do you have children? Nope. Where and when did you enter the military? Uh, I joined back in November 2003 out of a uh, Brockton recruiting station. And why did you join at the time? I guess, you know, I got four brothers and a sister that had joined before me, and uh, my father and both my grandfathers had joined, so it kind of seemed like the thing to do at the time, you know. Mm -hmm. And what branch did you join? Uh, Army Reserves. And at the time you joined, you were still in high school, is that correct? Yes. And what high school were you attending? Bridgewater Rainham Regional High School. Okay. And why did you choose the Army Reserves? I guess I kind of looked at the Army Reserves as like uh, the modern day Minutemen, whereas, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't want the Army to be my job, but I still wanted to join the Reserves and be like, you know, if the gov uh, country needed me, you know, I was still there, but I didn't want it to be my job, mm -hmm. my full time job. And you mentioned that you're, you're the youngest of seven, and all of them joined the military? I'm the youngest of seven children, and uh, I got four brothers and two sisters, and all four of my brothers joined, and one of my sisters okay. uh, joined. As well as your father? My father and both my grandfathers were in the military. All right. And where were you sent for basic training? I was sent to Fort Jackson in uh, South Carolina. And tell us what that was like. I was you know, pretty good experience. We were there for two and a half months, and uh, you just go there with, you know, hundreds of people that you don't you don't know, you never met before, and you got no idea what's going on. You just know that within those two and a half months, you're going to learn how to fire a weapon. You're going to learn how to navigate. You know, uh, throw wilderness. You know, you're going to learn how to kill people. You're going to mm -hmm. learn how to save people's lives. Uh, it was just a crazy experience. It was really fun. Mm -hmm. And at the time you signed up for the Army Reserves, you requested. Uh, I believe it was operating room technician. Yes. Yes. And you signed up, and as a result, was that your specialty for the remainder of your military career? Yes, I was an OR tech for six years in the Army Reserves. All right. What was your, uh, where was your first duty station after basic training? Well, after basic training, I, that's when I got sent to uh, San Antonio, Texas for uh, two and a half months of training mm -hmm. for, to be an OR tech. And what was involved in that training? Uh, well, the first two and a half months was just uh, pure classroom. You know, we were in a classroom eight hours a day, uh, five days a week, just learning how to be OR techs. Mm -hmm. And then for the second half of the training, it was about two and a half months. That's when we actually worked in a hospital. Uh, and we were OR techs. We're still in training, but we're still OR techs doing surgery and helping the doctors. And the second half actually took place in uh, Virginia. It was in Fort Belvoir, Virginia, mm -hmm. for the next two and a half months of that. Okay, so um, more about becoming an OR technician. Were you learning anatomy, hygiene? What was some of the courses you took? Yeah, for the classroom course, we had to take everything. We had to take anatomy and physiology. We had to learn, you know, hundreds and hundreds of different uh, medical instruments. We had mm -hmm. to learn sterile procedure. Uh, I think in the civilian world, it's a it's a two it's a two year degree, but they condense it down to a five month degree in the military. Mm -hmm. And what time, of this is of course, uh, are we still in now 2004, 2005? Yeah, 2004, my, my training went from 2004 into 2005. Mm -hmm. And where was your internship again? It was in uh, Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Okay, and after that, what happened? Uh, since, I was in the since I was in the reserves, after my training was done for basic and my MOS training, I got sent back home and mm -hmm. I went to uh, school for a year and that's when I was, went to back to my reserve unit, which was based out of Worcester. Okay, and where did you go to school? Bridgewater State College. And what was your major? Uh, at that point, I didn't really have a major. Okay. So now you're in Worcester, uh, 2005. When were you deployed to Iraq? One year later, in uh, 2006. Mm -hmm. And what time, uh, what time of the year in 2006? Springtime was right, I think it was about June. 
Mm -hmm. Now, before you went to Iraq, you had free deployment training. Tell us about that. Yep, before we, since we were a reserve unit, before we got sent to Iraq, we had four months of pre-deployment training out of Wisconsin. And that was when we just, uh, we re-went over everything that we had learned in basic training and mm -hmm. what we had all learned in our different uh, medical field training. And mm -hmm. it's when we all uh, learned to come together as a unit and work together. You know, active duty units, they, they work together every day, whereas mm -hmm. we were reservists. We only did two weekends a month, uh, uh, one weekend a month. So it was just an opportunity for us to get together and see how we'd run it as a hospital. All right. And when you were sent to Iraq, you were now part of a unit. What was the name of that unit? Uh, 399th Combat Support Hospital. Okay. So now you have been, now been sent to Iraq. Uh, you spent some time in Mosul? Yeah, our first four months we were stationed in uh, Mosul, Iraq, which is in the northern part. Mm -hmm. And then after those four, uh, first four months, we got sent to Al-Assad, Iraq, which is in about southwest mm -hmm. Iraq. Okay. At any time, were you in direct combat with the enemy? Uh, yeah, I mean, our, our bases got mortared all the time. We were in Mosul. We got mm -hmm. mortared all the time. And I think the first month there, I got awarded a combat action badge for... Uh, just the mortar attacks, you know, come close to death, they give you awards. Mm -hmm. And let's see, what was your rank at the time? Specialist. A specialist what level? Uh, it's an E4. Okay. And did you ever have um, any kind of air and naval support during the time you were in Iraq, or at least in that part of Iraq? Uh, I mean, we had patients. Mm -hmm. Air evac, you know, through all the, the helicopters and stuff like that. Okay. I mean, On average, how many patients did you handle? I mean, per day or per day. I mean, I guess it, I guess it all changed because we'd have, you know, times when patients wouldn't come in for days. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I mean, it, it's hard to say about new patients coming in because you know, s sometimes for a lot of the patients, you might get one patient. But you might have to do five different surgeries on them, so you might see them every day for a week, you know. But mm -hmm. while you're seeing these patients every day for a week, you might have more patients coming in. So it's, uh, you've got old patients that you're still doing surgeries on, you've got new patients mm -hmm. coming in. So I mean, it's, it's hard to say. We might do five, ten a day, sometimes fifteen. You know, we had mm -hmm. three different ORs running, so it might right. be fifteen surgeries, ten, five, ten. Were they um, military casualties or civilian casualties? Uh, both. We had military and uh, military, civilian, enemy combatants, you know, uh, we had a CMO, you know, Geneva Convention that says you just got to give everyone care, so we saw everyone. Okay. And did you, uh, uh, is there any particular case or cases that come to mind right now? I mean, yeah, there's a few cases that came to mind, uh, well, that come to mind. Uh, there's one guy who was an enemy combatant, and he was going out, sniping out American soldiers in the back of the neck, you know, there's a few inches in the back of the neck that weren't covered by anything. We had, you know, a k helmet that came down, only came down to here. We had, mm -hmm. you know, Kevlar bulletproof vests, but they only came up to here, so it was a few inches back here. This guy was going around sniping out American soldiers, and uh, he was doing that for a while, and then finally, after a few months, our, our guys had caught him, and then they had shot him, but they, only, they had only injured him. Uh, but they had caught him after he'd fired on one of the American soldiers. So they brought the sniper into our hospital and the American soldier that he had just, you know, shot. And uh, we were both doing, we had to do surgery on both of them at the same time, and they were in the same room, you know. And they were only, you know, a few feet away during surgery, so it was kind of, I uh, just weird seeing these two guys where, mm -hmm. you know, not even an hour before, and they were trying to kill each other. Now they're two feet away, and we're trying to save both their lives. Mm -hmm. And describe the terrain you were in first in Mosul. Uh, in Mosul, it was sand. Mm -hmm. There's a few trees around. Uh, that was pretty much it, just sand and trees and buildings, and mm -hmm. one-story buildings, nothing spectacular. All right. Were you on for an eight-hour day or pretty much straight through? Yeah, we did, we did eight-hour shifts. Our, our first month there, we didn't, we didn't get any days off. So it was, it was based off of a basic eight-hour mm -hmm. shift, but I mean, it's, it's the Army, so you got to come in early, stay late, you know, and then we were all on call uh, every day, so, mm -hmm. you know, people don't get injured on a eight hour schedule. So patients might come in at the middle of the night. So you might work eight hours, go back home to go to sleep, and then you might get a, a call that this patient's coming in, so you gotta wake up and 
do surgery for six hours and then come back and work another eight-hour day. But I mean, it was all based off the eight-hour schedule, but we were all on call for 24 hours a day uh, whenever the patients came in. Okay. Uh, did, you, um, did you feel your um, offices gave you good leadership during that time? Uh, some of them, some of them were real good leaders. Some of them were uh, real bad leaders. I think, in my opinion, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, just bad leaders. I suppose you know that there's the old saying: uh, there's some leaders that you would follow into hell, and there's other leaders that you'd push in. You know, uh, I think we had a few that, you know, I don't think anyone in the unit would mind pushing in to the uh, the fire. I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, you were never wounded yourself. No. No. And how would you um, evaluate the quality of medical care that uh, your, your unit provided? Uh, we gave great medical care, you know, we gave really good medical care. Uh, when, we, when we switched bases to Al-Assad for our second, you know, we were in Mosul for four months and we went to Al-Assad for eight months. Uh, we had opened, when we went to Al-Assad, we had opened a brand new hospital mm -hmm. and that was, that hospital was supposed to be opened by an active duty uh, army unit, but they gave it to us instead because we were doing so good in Mosul that they wanted us to open up this new, you know, state-of-the-art hospital in mm -hmm. Al Assad. So, as far as medical-wise, we were we were doing real good medical-wise, you know, and giving us that hospital over an active duty unit, which worked together every day, was a compliment to us. Okay, and how did you hear about the progress of the, the war in other areas? I, I don't remember really hearing mm -hmm. about the war uh, in other areas that much. I mean, there's uh, no way for us to really know. You know, we weren't privy to that kind of information. We just went in and did our jobs every day, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And what was? How did you get your news aside from the war? Uh, newspaper, email. Uh, again, I don't really remember mm -hmm. reading the news or anything over there. I mean, I'm sure I could have gone on. A computer or had someone send me the newspaper. Uh, I mean, while we were over there, I mean, we, we were living the news really. So I mean, I don't think any of us really felt a need to mm -hmm. read about what happened. You know. Did you get any letters uh, from your family? Yeah, I still wrote letters back home. And they still sent letters and care packages and everything. Okay. And as far as your siblings and your parents and grandparents uh, were concerned, did they offer you a you know, pat on the back? Hey, you're doing great. Things like that. Yeah, I mean, like I said, they were all in the military before. Uh, mm -hmm. Not all of them had fought uh, in overseas wars, but I mean, you know, they all understood uh, aspects of the military and, you know, the same care packages and letters and words of encouragement. Okay. So after four months in Mosul, uh, you're now spending eight months down at Al Assad. Uh, was the experience any different from uh, Mosul? Yeah, I mean, Mosul, we got mortar attacked all the time, uh, but for Al Assad, uh, we didn't get attacked once over there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Mosul was probably one of the more dangerous bases in the entire country, and Al Assad was one of the more safest bases in the uh, entire country. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, were you ever given R&R? &R? I mean, they tried to schedule us for days off every 11th to 13th day. So, mm -hmm. every 11th to 13th day, we got some time off. But, I mean, we still had extra duty to mm -hmm. deal with, but... Before combat, or at least before you got to Iraq, how much did you know about the Iraqis or the enemy you faced? Uh, during our pre-deployment training in Wisconsin, they gave us uh, cultural classes so we could learn a few, uh, uh, a few words and we can learn a few things about their culture so we wouldn't offend them because, you know, we had to work with uh, interpreters in the hospital mm -hmm. as well to deal with patients and family members and stuff like that. So uh, we had some basic cultural training beforehand. Mm -hmm. Do you feel you were properly trained and equipped? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think they they train us they train us well. Uh, I mean, our some of our hospital equipment in our first hospital in Mosul, mm -hmm. a lot of that stuff was pretty crappy. But in Al Assad, we had some state of the art stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. Excuse me for one moment. All right, you said you were in. Um, Army Reserves or in that unit for six years? Yeah. Can you clarify that? Yeah, uh -huh. Army Reserves for six years. Uh, what happened after uh, your last station in Iraq? Uh, after Iraq, we just all came back and just went to our regular reserve days, okay. you know, one week in a month, two weeks a okay. year. And when did you leave Iraq? 
Uh, we left Iraq. Uh, we got to Iraq October 2006, and mm -hmm. then we left the following year, October 2007. And you could, but you stayed in the Army Reserves. Yeah, I mean, I I did a six-year contract, so okay. I still had two years left, I think, after that or something like that. And what you do in those remaining two years? Uh, same thing we did beforehand. You just go that one week in a month and just mm -hmm. I don't know. Where try were you to stay out of trouble? You know? And where were you stationed? Still out of Worcester? Uh, then at that point I was taught in Massachusetts. Taunton, okay. And when were you discharged? Uh, let me think. I think last last year. Uh, Which was two thousand? Well, two thousand nine, two thousand ten. Yeah, I think it was two thousand. I got. I honestly can't remember. Two thousand nine, two thousand ten, something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. It was. It was. I, I. I signed a two by eight contract. So I was in the Army Reserves for. You know, everyone in the military signs an eight year contract. Even mm -hmm. if they're only in for four years. They're still in the inactive ready reserves for mm -hmm. however many years is left on their eight-year contract. So I mean, I actively drilled with the reserves for six years, and then two more years in the inactive ready reserves, which meant, you know, I didn't have to go to drill. I could grow a beard. I could grow my hair. But mm -hmm. if anything big happened, they could still call me back. You know. Okay. So are you officially now discharged from I'm the army? I'm still in the inactive ready reserves. Inactive. But I mean, I don't. I don't do anything. It's just that if something does happen, they can still call me up for the okay. next year. Mm -hmm. And what uh, what's what was your rank? Specialist. You're still a specialist. Yes. Okay. Uh, what level? Uh, just still E4. 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 Okay. And aside from the medal you mentioned, do you st uh, any other decorations? Uh, yeah, I got a combat action badge. Uh, mm -hmm. After Iraq, I got awarded the uh, Army Commendation Medal. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think our unit got some kind of unit award. I forget what that was, but mm -hmm. it was some big unit award that we got for our, our entire time of service overseas. Mm -hmm. What were your feelings about coming home? Uh, I don't know. What do you mean by? Well, coming home from Iraq after a year and being you know, in one of the busier theaters in that uh, conflict, were you relieved about coming home? Happy? Yeah, I mean, definitely we were we were all relieved to come home. I mean, yeah, I mean, to an extent, I'm sure, you know, myself, I definitely miss being uh, overseas after mm -hmm. a while, you know, come back home and uh, life just loses that intensity and passion and purpose that war has, you know, so after a while coming back home, uh, you kind of miss it, you know. Mm -hmm. And when you came home, did you, did you talk about your experiences with your family and friends? No, not really, no. Okay. Uh, did you join any veterans organizations such as the Legion? Mm, no. no. How about, um, have you yet to receive any veterans benefits or take advantage of the GI Bill Oh uh, Yeah, I've been going to school for the last few years, so mm -hmm. I've been using my GI Bill, post 9-11 GI Bill. And have you received the uh, welcome home bonus from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? Yep, I got that right after I came home. Excellent. Do you uh, attend any reunions with your old outfit? Do you keep in touch with any? Um, I mean, not unit mm -hmm. reunions, but I still have friends that I talk to. Mm -hmm. And how important to you was serving in the military? I mean, important. In well, you were mentioning earlier that you had joined because you had siblings in the military, your, fa your parents had served, your grandfather. Uh, was it really important? How important was it to you? I mean, looking back at it now, you know, I was in, I'm 24 years old and I was in for uh, mm -hmm. six years. So, I mean, it's a quarter of my life uh, that I spent in the military, you know. So, I mean, it's definitely uh, who I am now. You know, it's definitely an important uh, part of who I am now. Mm-hmm. Um, aside from the experience that you described earlier, uh, any other experiences stand out? Uh, from Iraq? Specific? From Iraq. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, things that stand out. You know, there's good things that stand out. There's bad things that stand out. Uh, any of the good things? Uh, I mean, just going over there and 
helping people, you know, just hanging out with friends, you know, really. I mean, what I remember most, best things out there is just hanging out with friends, you know, chain smoking cigarettes and uh, playing guitar and just sitting out in the heat and mm -hmm. playing guitar and chain smoking cigarettes. Yeah. And any of the bad things? Uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff that happens over there that uh, people mm -hmm. would rather talk about, you know. Be, uh, before we go any further, let's talk about this. Yep. This is, uh, you published this, I believe, last year? Yeah, it came out uh, 2009, 2000. fall of 2009. Yep. And tell us what's, uh, what the book is all about. It was just a memoir of my time in Iraq and uh, some of the, the peccadilles that go on behind the scenes. You know, it's not a political book. It's not pro-war or anti-war. It's not mm -hmm. uh, about this or that. It's just about the true stories that go on. You know, you read a lot of stories about Iraq and Afghanistan and they, especially stories by journalists and stuff like that, they'll paint, you know, these one-dimensional uh, characters of soldiers where it's like everyone's still that John Wayne character, you know. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to... Uh, I tell a real story about the uh, the real soldiers behind the, you know behind the headlines behind these just you know one dimensional characters you know I just want to give a real mm -hmm. depiction of who people really are you know the the goods the bads you know the the peccadilles that go on with human nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and how long did it take you to write that book? Well, it was all based off uh, my journal in Iraq. I kept a journal over there. I mm -hmm. wrote it in a, not every day, but pretty much every day. Uh, sometimes more than once a day and. So I wrote it the whole time I was deployed overseas, and then I came back home, and one year after being home, I got the book deal. So I wrote it all in Iraq and kind of edited it a little bit, and a year mm -hmm. later got the book deal. Okay. And is there any chapter that uh, stands out? Uh, no chapter specifically. I mean, it's just a one, you know, long journey of the time in Iraq, just from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. And uh, so nothing really sticks out particularly, you know, moving to me or anything like mm -hmm. that. Do you want to go back to Iraq uh, someday? I mean, if the Army sent me, I wouldn't really mind it that much. I mean, we made uh, good money over there. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was, like I said, it was very intense and there was a lot of good people over there, a lot of, uh, so it was definitely a fun time. But I mean, go back as, as if like some of the Vietnam vets go back to Vietnam for vacation. I mean, I don't see, a, I don't see Iraq being a vacation resort anytime. Mm -hmm. Any um, memorable experiences with friends, uh, or rather, um, any memorable characters or uh, or people from your experience you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, you know, they say they say the best thing about the military is the people, you know, and they also say the worst thing about the military is the people, you know. Uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, uh, unique characters I met in the military. You know, these the characters that people think only exist in literature or film, you know, they all exist in the military at the same time. You know, I met, in basic training, I met a guy who had been to KKK rallies, you know, and that was back in 2004, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I've met people that were drug dealers, cokeheads. Uh, I've met people that were, their families were multi, multi hundred millionaires and they were still joining the military, you know. I've met people, mm -hmm. uh, whose families made, you know, $20,000 a year and they were still joining the military. So, I mean, there's just such a wide range of people in the military, you know, just, it's not just this, you know, like I said, again, those one-dimensional characters, you know, just a broad spectrum of everybody, you know. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing these days? Um, earning my bachelor's degree in creative writing and just working on some different writing as much as I can, really. Mm -hmm. Um, ha aside from the book, have you um, published articles or? Uh, I've written on the Washington Ting Post blog before and I, I keep my own website and blog. Uh, I'm working on a few more stories right now, a few more books. Mm -hmm. And what's the name of your website? Uh, MassCasualties.com And I was taking a look at the book before the interview and just a list of uh, endorsements you've received is pretty impressive, including Howard Zinn, the late, great Howard Zinn, right on the front. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the last books he uh, endorsed before he passed away. I mean, one of the things I, I try to do with it is I, I, I tried to get uh, endorsements from uh, both sides of the spectrum, you know, Democrats mm -hmm. and Republicans, pro-war and anti-war people, historians and psychologists, like mm -hmm. on the back there's Philip Zimbardo, who did the, the famous uh, Stanford prison experiment, and I just asked him, I wanted to get his opinion 
on you know the book because he dealt with you know the psychology of uh, you know his famous experiment back in the 60s or 70s or whatever it was. Uh, so you know, and then there's the president of the ACLU, and then there's former Senator Gary Hart, and then there's you know Bing West, you know, who was uh, assistant secretary of defense for Ronald Reagan, and he was a mm -hmm. former Marine, you know. So I just tried to get Marines, Army, Air Force officers, and enlisted Democrats, Republican, historians, psychologists. I just wanted to get uh, mm -hmm. hear their opinions on you know what was mm -hmm. really going on over there. And when you were in Iraq doing this journal, did you have in mind? Uh, publishing a book one of these days based on the journal? No, never. I never really uh, thought about writing a book on the journal. We, we had all joked about, you know, all the shenanigans that were going on. We had all joked that it would make a good TV show or something like that, but we never thought about I, I never thought about writing a book while I was over there, really. Uh -huh. So, and if anyone wanted a copy of the book, where would be the uh, best way to get one? I think you can go into any bookstore, or they mm -hmm. can go on Amazon.com or there's links from my website. Okay. Above all, is there one thought or incident you would like to share with your family or others who will see this tape? Uh, I mean, the, big, the biggest thing that I think affected me over in uh, Iraq was when the, uh, the Army tried to get us to take uh, these anthrax shots. Mm -hmm. uh, we had our, you know, our unit leader had called our entire unit into a, in an auditorium and told us, you know, it was one of those big things, you know, mandatory meeting, you know, the commander's got something to say. So our entire unit goes to the auditorium and he tells us, you know, listen guys, you guys got to take this new anthrax shot. So we're like, all right. And then he hands out these pamphlets, you know, the pamphlets say like anthrax shots, a series of six shots, it's FDA approved, you know, you got to get it. So like, so me and my friend, we're like, you know, this is kind of weird. Why are they making us get shots? We're in the middle of Iraq, you know, already. And then the commander, he kind of, he's up on stage giving his little speech. He's like, you guys got to all get these shots or else. And we're like, you know, this, you know, this is weird. Why would the commander add or else to this? You know, you mm -hmm. give a command, you don't add or else. Right. You know? So we're like, this is, this is shady. So we went back to our hospital and we Googled the anthrax shot, you know, because uh, hospitals have special internet access, whereas, you know, Doctors need to be able to communicate across spectrums. Mm -hmm. They need to be able to look up things and look up records and stuff. Mm -hmm. So the hospital had special internet access. So we went in there and we Googled the anthrax shot, you know. First thing we Google it, first 30 pages on Google come up about soldiers dying from getting the anthrax shot, soldiers getting injured, you know, out of all these people getting the anthrax shot. You know, there's been like 20,000 that have been seriously injured from like Lou Gehrig's disease to gully and bar, you know, to shrinking of the brain. Uh, and it's linked to, I don't know if you ever heard of the Gulf War syndrome from the first Gulf War, where there's hundreds of thousands of vets that all have like these neurological problems, right. you know, mm -hmm. where it's uh, anthrax is linked to that, you know, where it's, that's what, you know, you've got people that are black and white and uh, different religions and Asians and, you know, all these, you know, male and female and all these things that separate them, but yet they all have these similar diseases and neurological problems and what's connecting them is like, Shots like the anthrax shots, you know. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we Google this in the first 30 pages. I mean, nothing good comes up about the anthrax shot. So we're like, this is, this is weird, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we find out that there's been zero long-term research on the anthrax shot, like absolutely zero. And we find out that even though the anthrax shot was FDA approved, what had happened is the company got FDA approval for this thing called the AV, whatever it was, AVIP anthrax shot or whatever. So it mm -hmm. got FDA approval. But once the company got FDA approval for the shot, they changed all the crap around, but the name oh, still the had heavens. FDA approval. So we're reading this, we're like, you gotta be kidding me. We're reading about all these soldiers that had, uh, you know, died from the anthrax shot. We're reading about Gulf War syndrome and all these other people that, you know, just have these uh, problems with them after they got the shot. So we're like, you know, this is messed up. And then, you know, we researched even further and we found mm -hmm. out that, you know, statistically, uh, you're statistically thousands of times more likely to get sick from the shot than you are to ever come in contact with anthrax. Cause the anthrax shots only protected against, uh, you know, one form of anthrax. It didn't even protect against, you know, the airborne anthrax, which is what they were worried about, you know. Uh, and even up to date now, there's been zero anthrax attacks in Iraq or Afghanistan, but yet there's been all these people that have died from the shot, and there's been all these people that have been injured from getting the shots, you know, but there's been zero anthrax attacks. Uh -huh. So, you know, our, our commanders come down like, all right, you guys all got to get this shot. We're like, this is, this is weird. You know, and I was talking to my roommate. My roommate's friend was in the military as well. 
and uh, he got the shot, and now he's got like the flu for the rest of his life, you know, because there's just all these weird things that happen from it. So we're reading this, we're like, what are you, you gotta be, you gotta be shitting me, right? We're not getting this shot, right? We're all medical people, you know, we understand uh, these mm -hmm. things. So the commander comes down, he's like, all right, you guys all gotta get this shot. And, you know, all the doctors, they refuse to take the shot, the nurses, anesthesiologists, you know, pharmacists, they're all like, you know, we're not taking the mm -hmm. shot. So, and me, my friend, and everyone in the OR refused to take the shot. So about a third of the unit refused to take the shot. And these were all, like I said, the doctors, anesthesiologists, people, you know, people know what the shot's about. You know, they're not going to get this shot. Uh, so this makes our commander look really bad because a third of the unit is refusing the shot. But not only that, but the Army was making the shot mandatory for everyone to get. So it made the entire mm -hmm. Army look bad because a medical unit of all units was refusing to take the shot, you know. And they're trying to force the shot down, uh, force the shot on everyone else when the medical people won't even take the shot. So we were making our commanders look pretty bad. We were making the army look pretty bad. So then our commander came down. And he's like, you know, this is a direct order to take this shot. You know, if you refuse a direct order, during the time of he told us it was a direct order to take the shot. And if you refuse a direct, a direct order during a time of war, he told us that he can put us in jail. So now he's telling us if we refuse to take the shot, you know, he's going to put us in jail and all these things. And he told us not only that, but you know, he can discharge us out of the military with. A dishonorable discharge and a dishonorable discharge follows you around like a, like a felony you know mm -hmm. so all these doctors you know they've got their medical licenses through the military you know a lot of these um, higher-ups uh, pharmacists and anesthesiologists and you know nurses they were all in for 27 years and they're all worried about losing their retirements and stuff right. like that uh -huh. so a bunch of them cave and he gives us another day to get the shot or not to get the shot so a bunch of people cave few of them still holding out where they're like, you know, listen, it's not medically safe, we're not gonna get the shot. So then the commanders again, they come down, we're still making the commanders look bad. They, they come down again, they're like, you know, listen, you refuse a direct order, you know, this is the time of war, you know, we can put you in jail, you know? So they're basically saying, you know, take the shot or we're gonna put you in jail, give you a felony, a dishonorable discharge is gonna follow you around like a felony. So a bunch of the people are like, you know, this is insane, you know, we're, we're here <laughs> fighting for what? What are we here fighting for? You know, you have to threaten to put us in jail and, uh, to give us, you know, dishonorably discharged. So, you know, more and more people get the shot, you know, and finally, you know, a lot of people finally back down. Finally, it's only my friend and I from uh, uh, from the OR, you know, finally it's him and I and just one or two, a few other people that are still holding out, you know, and they're really, you know, harping on to us. They're like, you know, listen, we're mm -hmm. gonna put you in jail if you don't take this shot, you know. We're doing more and more research and we found out that the only reason that the Army was making all these shots mandatory was because they had bought a bunch of them during the first Gulf War and they were all about to expire. So we're like, you gotta be, I mean, these were about to expire within like a week, some of them, you know? So uh -huh. like, they're like, yeah, you know, you gotta be kidding us. You know, this is, uh, this is insane. You know, we're more likely to get sick from this shot. And, and besides that, I mean, it was really just a question of like, are we soldiers here to do the right thing or are we just sheep that are gonna do whatever we're told to do? You know, we're mm -hmm. not, you know, we're not here to do whatever you tell us to do. We're here to do what's right, not, whether you ordered us to do it or regardless of what your orders are, you know, we're here to do what's right. So finally, we're still making our unit look bad, you know, even though there's only a handful of us holding out at this point. And my NCOIC, who was in charge of us in the OR, he's a real dirtbag, he comes down to me and my buddy who are still holding out, and he tells us, he's like, you know, if you refuse direct order, dir direct order during a time of war, I can take you back and shoot you, you know, we're like, you gotta be kidding us now. You know, we're over in Iraq, you know what, you know, we're fighting for all these things and this guy's telling us he can shoot us. You know, we've got our NCIC supposed to be looking out for us, telling us he's gonna, he can right. shoot us if uh -huh. we don't take us. We got our commanders telling us that, you know, they're gonna put us in jail if we don't take the shots. We're like, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be shitting us. You know, this is mm -hmm. insane. Uh, so, I mean, really at that point, you know, after he, after he threatened, after he threatened us at that point, it's like, you know, we, you know, we knew what the right thing was no matter what. I mean, the right thing was to be men, you know, I mean, there's men and then there's sheep, you know, we were, you know, we were men. And, uh, so we were like, you know, we're not gonna let this happen. You know, we're, you know, we're here to do our jobs. We're here to save lives. You know, we're not gonna take some stupid uh, anthrax vaccine. So basically, it was the last day to. Uh, so they gave us one more day to take the shot or refuse the shot. And, you know, this guy's saying he can shoot us. They're saying they can put us in jail if we don't take the shot, and they will put us in jail. So it's our last day, and me and my friend were, uh, you know, we're walking. They were chain smoking cigarettes. We're walking there to either mm -hmm. get the shot or refuse the shot. And, uh, you know, we're still kind of thinking about it, you know, because neither of us wants to go to jail, you know, really. Uh, neither of us wants to deal with the going to jail or getting discharged or anything like that. But 
you know, my buddy's holding out, and he's kind of waiting for me to back down and saying, saying I'm getting the shot so that he can back down. I'm waiting for him. He's waiting for me. We're walking there, chain-smoking cigarettes, and, uh, you know, still thinking about what to do. And uh, uh, You'll have to read the book to find out how it ends. But, ah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that really sticks out. I mean, that, that, for me, that was just one of those big moments where it's, you know, you're just doing the right thing no matter what the Army's saying. Like, mm-hmm. I think of uh, one of my... Army heroes is Hugh Thompson Jr. from uh, mm-hmm. his story is I think it was right after the My Lai massacre where he was driving he was he was in charge of a helicopter and he saw a group of uh, I can't remember if it was a group of Marines or a group of soldiers and they were coming upon a bunch of unarmed men and women civilians mm-hmm. and the guy Hugh Thompson Jr. he ordered his helicopter to fly down to the ground and he put his helicopter in between the I can't remember like I said I can't remember if Marines or soldiers let's call them soldiers. So he flew his helicopter in between the Marines and the soldiers. So there's the innocent civilians here, and there's the Marines here, and they were getting, or the soldiers and the soldiers were getting ready to go kill these innocent civilians. So he was an American soldier, and he landed his helicopter, and he, he aimed his guns at his fellow American soldiers. You know, he's mm-hmm. like, if you, you know, cross this line, you know, drew a line in the sand, he says, you know, if you cross this line, I'm going to shoot you guys. You know, you're not going to kill these innocent civilians. So he kind of just drew that line in the stand between what was right and what wasn't right. You know, mm-hmm. he wouldn't let uh, himself or anyone else cross that line. You know, and at first, once he did that, you know, everyone was pissed at him. They wanted to kick him out of the military. They're like, "Oh, you can't aim your guns at a fellow American soldiers." You know, uh, but finally, people saw that it was the right thing to do, and they kind of just gave him the recognition he deserved. You know, so I mean, I kind of think of uh, scenarios and stuff like that when it's you know situations arise where it's not about following orders. You know, mm-hmm. his orders were to do a patrol. They weren't to, you know, aim his guns at as an American soldier, you know. So sometimes it's not about following orders. It's about doing what's right regardless of orders, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, have you spoken to any other um, veterans of the Persian Gulf War, uh, one or two, uh, about the book or about your experiences? I mean, yeah, all, all the time. I mean, mm-hmm. I get emails every day from, you know, vets, you know, sharing their experiences about, mm-hmm. you know, what's going on, uh, just talking back and forth about the war and after mm-hmm. the war, I, you know, I still talk to all my friends from the unit. I, uh, I have talked to a, you know, a bunch of different people. I mean, you go to veterans, veterans events and there's like mm-hmm. veterans communities at schools and stuff like that. And, you know, I do a lot of speaking for the book, uh, book signings and book tours and speaking. So I, I mm-hmm. talk to a lot of vets uh, through that way, you know. Any older vets? Yeah, I mean, all the time, you know, mm-hmm. Vietnam vets, they come to all the book signings and mm-hmm. all the speaking engagements. There's always some Vietnam vets in the audience. Okay. Is there anything we haven't asked you or any additional comments you would like to make? Uh, nothing I can think of right now. No. Well, Michael Anthony, thank you for your participation in the program. We wish you luck with the book and any future writing projects. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks.